Welcome. Good morning to those of you here in Hawaii, uh, afternoon or evening to those joining us from other places. Thanks so much. This is Think Tech Hawaii. It's Thursday, February 17th, 2022. And we have with us today one of my dearest and most admirable and accomplished friends, Tracy Wilkin, the longtime executive director of the Mediation Center of the Pacific, uh, Hawaii's emblematic and actually nationally respected community mediation center, which has outreach now to various sectors of the society from the judiciary and the courts to the community, to the business community, to the government community, and has them all working collaboratively and cooperatively together on things in ways that have not been seen. And we'll kind of circle back to that toward the end of this session and talk about what the role and value of MCP and mediation have been. But just to start us all off on the same page, Tracy, just a short, simple, plain language explanation. What is mediation as opposed to arbitration, meditation, litigation, all those other things? It's a great question, Chuck. You know, even though mediation has been around a long time, um, not everybody understands what it is and how it works and how it differs from all those things that you mentioned. So mediation is essentially it's a process. We bring people together uh, who are in conflict and the mediator who's impartial, doesn't take sides, doesn't tell people what to do, doesn't give legal advice and doesn't counsel but actually helps these parties in conflict listen to each other in a way they haven't been able to, talk to each other in a way they haven't been able to, and negotiate agreements that work for them. Key principles about mediation. Mediator does not tell people what to do. So it's up to the parties if they wanna reach a resolution. And the other important thing is mediation is confidential. So those discussions in mediation, if they do end up in a formal legal proceeding, um, are off the table. Mediator isn't going to testify on behalf of anybody. Uh, if there's an offer made, but there's no formal agreement that's finalized and signed, that offer is off the table. So it's really a great, flexible, informal process that helps people come up with their own solutions to their problems. And who better to resolve your problems than the people who are in the conflict? Fantastic. What elements to you, what attributes, characteristics make mediation as a form or process of communication best suited for this kind of conflict management and resolution? You know, that's an interesting question, and that's the answer is really part of what attracted me to mediation many years ago. It's because people often don't know how to communicate with each other. When communication breaks down, um, it's hard to problem solve. And in particular, when people are in conflict, even people who may typically be good communicators in conflict because you let your emotions drive you, um, you basically aren't listening to each other. You know, you can do the simple test and, and think about the last time you were in conflict with someone and they're in front of you and they're talking. And I ask, what, what are you thinking about? And, and everybody's going to say, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say when they stop talking. And so mediation changes that dynamics. And I always tell people when I'm training them as mediators, the secret of mediation, here's the secret. So when people are in conflict, we know they don't listen to each other. But as a mediator gains the trust of the parties, because we spend a lot of time listening to each person privately and together, the, me the parties then trust us. And then what happens is we listen to their story and then we start conveying their story to the other party. They listen to us, but what they're really listening to for the first time is each other through the mediator. And that's the secret. Sounds easy, well, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's a great way to put it. And we know there are alternatives. People can do 
litigation in the courts and have the court system process it and, and determine it and be subject to appeal and, or they can go an arbitration route, which is sort of like a private trial, but with not many avenues of appeal, it has a greater degree of finality. And then of course there's physical conflicts, violent conflict, yeah. war, things like that. So what is it to you that makes mediation the best first choice for people in conflict who can't work it out themselves? Um, exactly what you said, it should be the first choice. And here's why, because as I mentioned, it's, it's an informal process. It's a process designed to help people feel as comfortable as possible. I'm not going to say that it's a fun, it's fun when you're in conflict. Um, but it helps parties start looking at the situation in a different way, um, ideally in a bigger way so that they can come up with creative solutions and they never have to enter the legal system. Uh, what's important is, again, that people are resolving the issues themselves. And when you think about the legal system, I mean, there's a place for it, certainly. Uh, it's an adversarial process. And so really it's about win-lose. And most conflicts, not all, but most conflicts shouldn't be about win-lose. Divorcing couples, it's not about winning and losing. It's about how do we end our story and move to our next story in our life um, without added pain and all the things that people go through. Or landlords and tenants, which is a big issue right now. Um, Maybe the tenant got behind, and we know over the last couple of years, tenants got behind in their rent because they lost their jobs. Uh, it shouldn't be about getting in court and fighting and putting pressure. It should be having that conversation to understand each other as people. Landlords need to be paid. Uh, maybe there was a reason tenants didn't pay, and maybe they're trying to do something about it, but to have that conversation and to reach that agreement themselves. And if you think about it, if everybody tried mediation first, a lot of the issues would get resolved. And then our really busy court system could focus on those issues that really need to be in court. Fantastic. So to develop a system and a structure and an institution to promote and make available these collaborative, confidential communication, problem-solving processes. It, what was the genesis of the Mediation Center? How and why did it get started? That's a great question. And that was a long time ago before I was involved. Uh, and it's a great story. Back in 1979, uh, when the Mediation Center of the Pacific, who was formerly Neighborhood Justice Center, was founded by a small group of people who had a great vision. Um, and actually it was a vision that was happening across the country. And the idea was, just as the name said, to enable neighbors to work out their differences in a way by sitting down and talking instead of calling the police on each other, instead of ending up in court and fighting. And this concept actually was happening across the country. So there were neighborhood justice centers created all over and a small group of people here on the islands who had the insight and the vision uh, received a grant and they brought over a trainer uh, from another state to do the first training of the first volunteer mediators. And so the Neighborhood Justice Center, now the Mediation Center of the Pacific, started as a very grassroots effort, actually in Makiki. So we're back where we started, although they were in a small green shack near Makiki pumping station, which is no longer there. And I will say that what happened is very quickly, at the same time, the courts were backlog, uh, looking for other ways to ease that backlog. And the courts immediately started looking at neighborhood justice centers, just like the neighborhood justice center of Honolulu. So while it started focusing on neighbor 
disputes, uh, the court started referring cases. And, and so from this very beginning, there was a bit of a maybe controversy. Should we really just focus on neighbor and community cases or should we focus on court cases? And I think the nice thing over the years, it's recognized we can do it all. Uh, and ideally it goes back to your comment. Those court cases, if they start with us, a lot of them won't end up in court. So great history, 43 years ago. Why then, why 1979 thereabouts? Uh, what was it that came together to grow that movement? Well, at the time, uh, the courts were, were looking at alternate ways. There was the Pound Conference where they started looking at an open door court system. And, and so it was really a movement across the country looking at how can we better serve people and the courts serve people. You know, for years, people were groomed to sue each other that's how people were educated and so we had so many people in our court systems that they couldn't adequately serve everyone and recognizing um, not every case belonged in the court system so it was really that is what started everybody looking at what else can be done and looking towards mediation and other dispute resolution processes and that's a fantastic way to put it, that when Frank Sander came up with his multi-door courthouse concept, which has just been absolutely seminal in conflict prevention, management, and resolution in this country and, and beyond, the choice of a collaborative, confidential, humane process was the mediation door. And the others all gave up a, a self-determined process for the parties. And the others all gave up all of those four key elements, the humanity, the self-determination, the confidentiality, and the collaborativeness. So where have those elements taken the Mediation Center in its evolution from the Neighborhood Justice Center back in the days of Peter Adler, Bruce Barnes, and others that we know. What along the way have been the most important building steps for the Mediation Center? It has been an exciting journey, and it's been an honor to be part of the Mediation Center for so long. And the foundation that has helped this organization get to the place where it is uh, making the impact on the community that it does is the people. And that's what a strong organization is all about. It's people who believe in the mission um, and together work together through good times and hard times to make sure that that mission is making an impact on the community. And so it's the hundreds of board members who have served on boards and um, help fundraise and help strategize and plan. It's the hundreds and hundreds of mediators who volunteered thousands of hours, Chuck. It, they're just amazing. And, and the staff members over the years, and particularly the last couple years, who work really hard to make sure that services are provided for the community. It's not about making money. It's about believing in a mission and believing the impact that it has on the community. And without all the dedication of the board, the mediators and the staff over the years, an organization like the Mediation Center of the Pacific, or as we fondly call it, MCP, wouldn't be able to do the work that it does. Um, if you look at the last couple years, the number of media hour, mediation mediator hours invested in mediating, and they're primarily volunteers, has more than doubled. And it's them giving their time 
and caring about the people that they're helping because they believe in the process and they see the positive outcome. That's fantastic. So how did MCP get the buy-in initially of the judiciary? And then we'll look at some of the other key stakeholder groups, government, private business, and others. So as, as I mentioned, you know, from the very start, when the Neighborhood Justice Center, now MCP, was formed, the courts started looking at community mediation centers. So we, we started out small, um, doing a pilot with small claims cases. And, and today we still mediate small claims cases for district court. And, uh, and then pretty soon it was family court looking uh, to the mediation center to assist. And, and so how do we do that? Um, it took designing training and curriculum, uh, conducting training for mediators to ensure that they have the skills, the, the knowledge and the support to be effective in these areas. And so, and I wanna mention, so not only do mediators volunteer their hours mediating, but they invest a lot of time going through trainings, uh, participating in workshops, constantly honing their skills. Another important evolution of mediation, as you know, originally, um, even when I was trained as a mediator many years ago, it was uh, a, a process and it was a very structured process. And once you went through this training, you were eligible to mediate anything. And, and as mediation has evolved, it's recognized that a mediator who mediates in specific areas governed by laws really needs subject matter expertise, not because we're giving legal advice, but because we need to understand the area to know the right questions to ask, to know when a party doesn't have enough information to negotiate so we can sum them out to get the resources they need. So, as the courts looked at us, we would develop curriculums, training, train a cadre of mediators. We even now target recruit in specific areas to make sure that every area that we're serving and, and providing services in, we have appropriately trained mediators. And so in addition to providing mediation and dispute resolution, we're constantly developing and conducting trainings and workshops. Um, which is wonderful. So that's a fantastic example of how a collaborative coalition was built from the beginning with the judiciary and knowing that the head of the judiciary is always the chief justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. I'm sure that Ron Moon and uh, C.J. Rehnquist, uh, not Rehnquist, Rechtenwald, there, there's a faux pas of major proportions. <laughs> we, we have not been working with <laughs> Chief that, Justice Rehnquist. Yeah, Ron Moon and Mark Rechtenwald have been just absolute exemplars of the perfect people for those collaborative coalitions and support. Uh, how did MCP establish collaborative coalitions with the business sector and with the government, especially the legislature, which has been from time to time, not the easiest to relate collaboratively with for some. Yeah, it, it has been um, the last few years developing these partnerships has been absolutely amazing. And, and the key reason is mediation is appropriate and needed in, in every arena. And so as a court, we develop programs with the court, oftentimes cases that are sent to us to mediate are, are from the business arena. Plus the business arena also recognize the value of our trainings. And so a lot of them come to us to train, for example, their managers. We have an informal uh, mediation skills for managers training. So they're not formal mediators, but they learn these skills to be more effective as managers. And, and so as we have had them participate in trainings and we've conducted mediations, uh, then we start looking at how can we better serve them 
are there other things we can be doing? So a, a good example is the Kapuna Pono program that was developed several years ago with uh, Chuck Hurd, who was a, a longtime mediator um, and had this vision to help create Kapuna Pono with the large uh, number of elders in Hawaii and, and many of them living a very long time and requiring care in their older age. And of course in Hawaii, when you need care, it comes from family. Um, and the stress that, that um, happens when families are caring for a loved one, I mean, it, conflict is inevitable. And so we created the Kapuna Pono program to bring families who are caring for an elder together uh, so that one, the elder's values and wishes um, can be vocalized so all family members hear and the family members can have a discussion with the assistance of facilitators to talk about how each person can support that care and desire of the elder person. And so as we develop this, then we recognize a lot of the, the, the conflicts fall within the healthcare arena. So we then developed partnerships. We started with Kaiser Permanente and um, work closely with them. Um, and now we are working with other healthcare providers. So they are educating families about this opportunity. And, and so again, this wonderful partnership and the same thing that we've done with businesses. Uh, and, and really that's how, um, I think the Mediation Center of the Pacific, particularly the last few years, has been able to have a greater impact on the community. I mean, certainly we're still mediating a lot of cases from the courts, which is important um, because we're helping them resolve issues and not fight it out in courts. But we have more partnerships and relationships with the healthcare arena, the business arena, so that we are encouraging and educating people to bring their issues to us early. Um, so they never have to hit the court system. And clearly MCP has reached out to and built collaborative coalitions with a number of state departments and agencies and, and county ones as well. It, of all the government entities, how did MCP manage to establish the collaborative coalition and working relationship with the ledge and Scott Psyche and, and the team over there in ways that have been elusive for so many for so long. So this is was a wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, in the midst of crisis, there are opportunities and certainly the pandemic uh, when it started was a crisis. It was a crisis for many people. It was a scary uh, time for the Mediation Center of the Pacific. We had just purchased and moved into a new building so that we could uh, provide services even more so for the community. And um, we were invited to participate in um, on a committee uh, looking at the housing issue, looking at the landlord tenant issues since they're with a moratorium on evictions. Uh, landlords, needless to say, were frustrated. Tenants were frustrated. Uh, they did not not want to pay. Uh, so it was tough times. And, and it was, this subcommittee was actually created by House Speaker Psyche. And in, in, initially it was led by um, Jim uh, Koshiba, who was amazing and it brought a, broad cross section of stakeholders together. And in brainstorming and looking at the issues, uh, the importance and the value of mediation being able to assist in this area came up. And it was really Representative Nakamura um, who um, came up with the bill uh, to implement that when the moratorium ended, that the landlords would need to provide 15 days notice to tenant, but most importantly, would be required to participate in mediation if the tenant so chose. And the idea behind that was to give them the opportunity to work out solutions to be able to get the landlord paid, to ideally keep the tenant 
in their residence and to make sure we didn't have this huge backlog of cases at court. Um, and so this program um, started um, when the moratorium ended last August. It's statewide. Every community mediation center across the state is running the program. And there are five of us. There's two on the island of Hawaii, um, one on Maui, one on Kauai, and of course, us on Honolulu. And since August 7th, Chuck, just to give you an idea how the program's doing, we've opened over 1,600 cases. We've mediated uh, approximately 650 of these landlord tenant eviction cases, and almost 90% have reached agreement. Um, so the idea behind it has worked, and it's really to the, the credit of the stakeholders in the committee. Um, to Representative uh, Nakamura and Hashimoto for creating the bill. Um, and it really, I think, brought mediation to a, a higher level, to a higher level of vision. And I, my hope is that people see the value and it will continue to be a process used early on. That's fantastic. So, so many other things that we could go into that would have great value. In our last minute, where do you see MCP going from here? What's the vision? Uh, the vision is, I think we are going to continue working at this high level that we're at. Our caseload has more than doubled over the last year, um, and I don't see it slowing down. Um, and hopefully our numbers uh, of infection keep lowering so we can do more in-person mediation because primarily it's through um, Zoom right now. And uh, But I, I do see, even as the pandemic wanes and we're able to interact with each other, that we will continue to integrate the technology um, to make it accessible for everybody. We are working on better strategies to have um, more efficient language access for everyone and reaching out into the community. We'll continue to build on these partnerships. And I'm excited that the board um, and staff will be engaging in strategic planning to come up with a new plan to take MCP through the next five years. I don't see us slowing down. That's fantastic. Tracy, thank you so much for Hawaii's best example of how people can come together and build a collaborative, humane, problem-solving communication process for conflict prevention, management, and resolution in times when so much of other elements of society, so many, have been going in an opposite direction. Thank you for the model. Thank you for your example and for all you and your team and people have done to make all that you do possible. Thanks everyone for joining us. Hope many more will view this later on YouTube and Vimeo and come back and rejoin us next week for more ThinkTech Hawaii.